Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Luhr, and I'm delighted to go across the pond again, uh, catching up with my buddy, Rish Lotlikar, in San Francisco this morning. Well, my morning, his afternoon, evening there. Welcome to the podcast, Rish. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. I, you know, really, really enjoy our conversation. So love to be on with your audience. And, you know, it's a pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. And I, I want to sort of frame this a little bit because anyone will check out your backgrounds going, this gentleman has nothing to do with the world of sports. And this is the Sports Entrepreneur Podcast. Well, you know, and this is the important part. What we'll be talking about is extremely relevant to the world of sports, entertainment, music, or arts in general, um, because we're going to be talking about the world of NFTs, blockchain technology, which is coming in there. And that's uh, sort of really where we're going to spend a good time at the end or the later part of the podcast, because that's the world you live in. Uh, and this is, as I said, that's why it is so relevant. And that's why I have you here. But before we always do this, of course, we go into a little bit of the background. And and your background is as colorful as anyone I've ever seen and probably anyone I've ever had on the podcast. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun there as well. And we're going to sort of dive straight into it. So let me sort of, uh, for, again, uh, just, just introduce you in a more very general sense. So I, I would sort of uh, describe you as a... Um, a banker turned VC turned tech, crypto, and blockchain entrepreneur. And on top of it, you are clearly a digital nomad traveling around the world, uh, spend uh, you know time uh, around the world in, in Eastern Europe and other places, setting up businesses there. So we're going to touch on a few of those things and, and just hear your incredible story. So let's get in here, uh, Rishi. Uh, Let's start a little bit here with, with U.S. Navy and working as a surgical technician during university and, and all this sort of crazy stuff you did already before you ever even got into the, into the business world. Just, just give us a quick short story on that one. Yeah. So, you know, I, I went to Rice University uh, undergrad, um, but in high school, um, you know, before college, uh, there was a program in my in my high school, which was an army related program. And it's funny, I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically get some experience uh, because we had a, a, a like a rifle range at our school. And I was like, oh, how, how do I get involved in that? It, you know, it was like this military thing. And long shooting. story short, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I, it was just kind of cool. I would not been around any of that stuff. And, you know, it was like this was like the early 90s. It was like Desert Storm was going on. You know, I was like a teenage boy. I was like, wow, it was like. You know, there's like a military little command post in my high school and, you know, <laughs> what's this about? And so long story short, I got involved in that for a couple of, couple of years uh, just because it was, it was interesting and, uh, you know, never planned on going into the military um, and got a great experience, learned a lot. But my senior year, the colonel um, who was, you know, at my school, he was an army colonel, mm. came to me and said, hey, Rish, have you thought about the military after high school? And I'd only planned on going to you know, college. That was kind of the, the plan after, you know, high school for me. Right, right. And um, he said, you know, you'd do us a favor if you applied to the military academies and the military scholarships, because we think that you would probably get in with your grades. I'd done pretty well in high school. And, uh, you know, you'd kind of give us recognition at our program if you got in, you know? Right. And, I, you know, I really had a lot of respect for him. And so I said, sure, yeah, you know, that sounds like a you know, fair thing. I really did enjoy this program and, you know, I appreciate it. And so I applied and I ended up getting in <laughs> to all of the uh, – you know, the programs that the U.S. military has and the Army and the Navy. Right. Uh, and then, you know, right before college, I thought, you know what, might as well do it. And uh, and I ended up doing uh, the Navy. Uh, I, I received the Admiral Nimitz Scholarship and uh, oh. um, basically uh, did that uh, for a bit, learned a ton. Um, but I was I was planning on going to medical school and how it ends up working out in the military is when you, you know, have an aspiration at the end of, you know, kind of your training, they ask you what your first choice is and your second choice. And, you know, it turns out that uh, I wouldn't have been able to kind of 
be able to direct my career, especially if I want to go into medicine. And so I decided, you know, um, that I, I would just kind of go back to being a civilian. <laughs> um, but it was an awesome experience. I, I learned a ton. And, you know, a lot of my friends are Navy SEALs now and, you know, operating submarines and surface warfare. And I learned, you know, surface warfare, aviation, Marine Corps, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and then the submarine force. Um, so learned a lot and it was great. Yeah, I mean that sounds like an incredible start uh, to to your you know, whatever not even your career in, in that sense but uh, I love this um, now a lot of leadership yeah exactly I I can imagine the the, the learning is insane and as if we had a bit more time we would dig a little deeper in there so, but we have so much to cover here because you've done so many more things that uh, I want to pace us nicely here to the next level because somewhat if, if I look at it sort of you coming then out of college and and uh, you know I think you studied at Baylor's. Um, you, you ended up in the, I would call it, you know, with Aon, which is an insurance company. And then you spent, you know, obviously quite a bit of time, uh, in the early days there, uh, in, in the banking world. Why, you know, you wanted to be in, you said earlier, you want to, uh, you know, you'd be a, a doctor. How did you end up in the insurance and banking world? Yeah, so I went to grad school and I was pursuing an MD, MPH, MBA. So, you know, I was doing an MPH, MBA first, and the, the idea was to do the triple degree. Um, I'd gotten a grant. Triple to do the degree. MBA. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that even. <laughs> I didn't even... Yeah. <laughs> I heard yeah, double, I, but I've heard triple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Indian. So, you know, like education is <laughs> like one of the things like my mom and, you know, anyone I grew up with, like, really kind of respects. And so, yeah, right. you know, I didn't really, I just, it was for me, it was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, okay. um, and I'd gotten a grant to do the MBA, so I was like, "Oh, might as well add an MBA." I was originally do, planning on doing MPH, MD, MPH, and then I added the MBA. And instead of working in a hospital, so my college job was I used to take out eyes for transplant surgery, okay. uh, so surgically remove uh, eyes. That ouch. was my college job. Right. Yeah, um, but since I was getting the MBA, I thought I'd work in consulting, and I started off in consulting for a summer. Loved it and took this path, you know, a little bit less traveled for what I thought I was going to do and kind of my family and stuff like that and ended up, you know, doing consulting and then moving into investment banking in New York. I started off, uh, uh, you know, with with that healthcare background, ended up in public finance and then moved into corporate finance and M&A and healthcare, healthcare investment banking M&A. Right. Got it. That okay. a, That's yep. the link. OK, that makes some sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now. I, I read the you know on your on your CV here it's it's called the uh, uh, the Wall Street's program. What was that all about? Yeah, so you know I did investment banking. Uh, I was at UBS and HSBC. Um, you know, investment banking is a is a pretty hard um, profession to get into. Mm. Um, you know, especially at the at the larger banks. Um, you know, they have a very competitive uh, process to get a job there. It's partly because they just, you know, pay you pretty well and it's very competitive to get one of those jobs. They don't hire that many people in a speci in the specific department that I was talking about, which is, is M&A and corporate finance, you know, department. Right. And, and, you know, I, I kind of figured out, you know, how to do that. You know, how do you interview? How do you kind of learn the requisite, you know, skill sets to pass the interviews and how do you even kind of approach getting into an investment bank if you, you know, weren't weren't kind of doing that all along, which a lot mm. of people, you know, they come out of high school wanting to be an investment banker on Wall Street, right? right. So how do you how do you kind of ace them out of it and how do you win and, and get a job in those banks? Uh, right. And so after doing that for a while, when I went over to HSBC, HSBC at the time, you know, was building up their bank. They they didn't buy a bank like all the others did. They were building up, you know, person by person. And so mm. part of my job besides doing my investment banking role was to recruit and hire, you know, new new grads. And so I learned a lot about, right. you know, that part of the process. And and so one day I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, I was very entrepreneurial and I realized, you know, I, I didn't want to spend all my time, you know, working for the bank. I'd mm. love to like spend all, if, you know, if I, if I was smart enough for the bank to hire me, I should be smart enough to start something of my own was my philosophy. I like that. And, uh, yeah. And so I quit and I, I thought I had to start something. And the only thing I could think to start was a training program teaching people how to work on Wall Street because I had done the same thing. Like I knew how to work on right. Wall Street. I knew how to get the job. And so I started Wall Street program. That was like my first business idea. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Just to give also, I like always give some time frame here. We, we're now in sort of 2005 to 2007 here, right? So um, it's sort of past the internet bubble. Um, you're in, you're hanging out Wall Street. 
And, uh, you know, again, I would argue very shortly after, you're now getting into the VC world, right, with Spencer Task Ventures, I believe is the name of the company. Um, so how do you go from what you were doing there and, uh, you know, first gig in, the, in VC? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'd done investment banking, I quit and I started this company, Wall Street Program, you know, training, you know, students that were interested in getting uh, to work on Wall Street. And I was in the gym, actually, in my, my building. There's a guy in the building who's, you know, a pretty successful guy, I'd work out with him. And he, he asked me the same question, you know, what, what is it that you want to do next, you know, and, you uh, uh, and, and, you know, I was like, well, you know, I like this entrepreneurial thing. I, you know, this is fun. And I used to do invest in banking. And he was like, have you thought about venture capital? And I thought, wow, you know, that would be cool. But no, I, you know, I'd love to get a job in that, but I don't know anyone. And, you know, I don't know how to approach it. Um, and he, and he had a friend, his name's Adam Stern, who's now one of my best friends. Um, Adam was a VC in New York. Uh, he introduced me to Adam and Adam hi hired me on the spot. So, uh, wow. it was great. Good. Yeah. So. Literally went in for an interview, and next Monday I was working for Adam. Learned a ton from him. And yeah, one of my best. Friends. And, and again, there. I guess that's where again, healthcare and tech all sort of started to come together for you a bit, right? So uh, let me just just talk a bit about what what you were doing there. Um, you know, what sort of deals you were you were doing at that time, and and what businesses were you looking at? Yeah, so Adam, uh, and he still does, by the way, he's a uh, pretty well-known VC in New York, but he does a lot of uh, biotech and tech deals. Um, so a mix of both. He, he does a lot of biotech, which the healthcare background that I had, you know, was really helpful there. Mm. But he does a lot of tech, too. So we did, you know, just, you know, tech companies. Uh, consumer internet, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and the, and the, and the company I was at Spencer Trask Ventures. Spencer Trask is the guy who invested in Thomas Edison. Um, so it was a very long legacy to that wow. company, you know, yeah, it turned into GE, and they've done a lot of things. There's a guy who runs that company now who's kind of related to the original investor. And so, um, you know, we worked on world changing ideas. So that was the the focus. It was like anything that gonna, is going to change the world. And, you know, Adam specifically looked at a lot of biotech and tech. And for myself, I realized, you know, uh, out of those two, you know, I didn't have a medical degree. So biotech for me wasn't as interesting. And, and I was just more really interested in consumer tech. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, what I enjoyed is just as I was, I, I had this thought, like, you know, if I could do anything, what would I do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I ended up realizing I would do is probably, you know, be just like playing around on some tech, you know, platform or some consumer platform. You know, if I'm on the beach just hanging out, what am I going to do? You know, it's like look at something on my, my phone or my computer that that's kind of interesting and fun uh, to spend time and, you know, learn or whatever it happens to be. And it's like, like a tech platform, you know, right. um, and, and, and I thought that I don't need any training to do that. That's just like really innate. Like I can, I know what I like and I can just kind of eat my own dog food as I think about those things. And, and so that's what kind of drew me to doing more tech and less biotech. Got it. Got it. Now, again, let's see, how do we get from there into Eastern Europe? Uh, because obviously, you know, you're, you're going to great, sounds like a great job having fun there in New York, um, you know, in the VC world and and now you're all of a sudden and, and again I there was sort of a year or two which I can't even quite work out what you were doing <laughs> on the C V here. You and you in Eastern Europe, you in Ukraine setting up VCs there. How did that all happen? Yeah, so you know, two thousand nine, um, it was, you know, a slow time in, in the US economy and Western Europe due sure, to the housing the crisis. crisis. Yeah. Yeah, after the crash. And, you know, I'd, I'd spent uh, time living in Europe, uh, in Madrid, Paris, and London, and gone out to Eastern Europe um, before grad school. So back in 1999, I'd gone and spent some time living in Europe. And in Eastern Europe, I was in, you know, Prague and, and uh, um, you know, spent a little time in, in Northern Czech Republic. And, and so I'd always had this kind of international bug. You know, it's funny, I'm doing Superworld now, but I've always had this like strong, you know, interest in being very global. Right. And I was sitting in New York and I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be cool? Because, you know, Europe and, and North America, U.S. weren't as 
you know, they were we were more stagnated compared to the emerging markets. If right. you looked at the growth in India or you know Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe or South America compared to the U.S., it was still pretty good. You know, they weren't as affected by the housing crisis. Right. Um, and you know, I thought you know that that could be an interesting proposition. So I had an idea. Wouldn't it be cool to start a venture capital fund somewhere in the emerging markets? I've learned a lot from Adam. Mm. Um, you know, learned how to raise capital, learned how to structure deals. You know, I'd taken a couple of companies public. And so I was like, you know, I could do this. So I got on a Yeah. I got on a plane, didn't know anyone. I went to Ukraine, Russia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Moldova. It took me about a year and a half. You know, that's where the year and a half comes in. Oh, right. okay. um, but I started yeah, but I started a VC fund uh, backed by Victor Pinchuk in East, in in Ukraine. Amazing. So uh, yeah. So uh, you know. So again, that's uh, you know you the person who you who's backing you. Um, you knew or you came across. Uh, he said, "Okay, Rishi, I, I think I like you. You you're a smart guy. Let's go. Uh, you know, invest some in some uh, I guess companies in in that part of the world. Um, you know, just just give us one story of that. How do we you know how how can we visualize that? Yeah, so that's actually funny. So I went there. I didn't know anyone. I didn't speak Russian, um, yeah. and uh, you know, um, I uh, I got there and uh, I, I I I went down to Crimea. I lived in Crimea for a while, then moved to to Kiev. Right. Um, you know, I, I I did get a win after my first month there. So I met my wife, who I'm married to, and have two kids now. Yes. Um, so that that was a very positive, uh, you know, uh, thing that event Good that start. happened. Uh, yeah, good start. Obviously, we didn't get married right away, but we met then, and we ended up, you know, living in Ukraine together for four years, and then getting married in Asia uh, a few years later in, in Vietnam when we lived there. But um, long story short, I didn't know anyone, and so I had an idea. You know, what if I start an event company? Uh, and one because it's fun, but two because maybe it's a great way to know people. Mm -hmm. And I started this really cool event company in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, centered around expats and, and uh, just like places in, 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 in Kiev that were owned by, you know, locals that were really nice that want, you know, great places that wanted to market themselves. Mm. Um, and it turned out to like the first event ended up having, you know, 250 people attend. It became this huge hit. Wow. The, the top magazine in the city like partnered with us. And about six months or maybe an, a year in, um, I met a guy at the event who knew me from New York, and I didn't even know he knew me from New York. He was like, Rish, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, what do you mean? This is my event. And he was like, I know you from New York. And I was like, oh. And he was like, I came to your party in New York. I'm pretty social, so I used to do these big parties in New York. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, you're from New York? I thought you were from this event. And he was like, yeah, I was at this event too. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, I, I want to start a VC fund. And he was like, well, do you know Victor Pinchuk? And I was like, no, I don't know him. And uh, so he ended up introducing me to Victor's, uh, you know, uh, entity and the, the team there. And and Victor's a very big LP. So he's the guy who backed Yuri Milner, a DST. This DST put in like $500 million into Facebook. And he's a big LP of other pretty big funds. And so, right, right. Uh, you know, so met this with is him. East we Labs? Him. Or are we yep. talking about it moment? East or Labs. East Labs. All right. Okay. East Labs. East Labs. Yeah. That's how we started East Labs. I partnered up with two other partners, uh, Evelyn Bushatsky and Olga Belkova. And we started East Labs and ended up investing in about 35 companies out there. Wow. And, and just give me an idea. What 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 money are we talking about? Uh, hundreds of millions, tens of millions, or what's the sort of size of the stuff you guys are doing there? Yeah, so it's an early stage accelerator, and the point of it was to you know uh, facilitate the you know the start of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in right. Ukraine. In Ukraine, right. they have a ton of developers, and mm. usually all the developers in outsourcing, right? right? And so the pitch was if you could get these guys together, help them, you know do seed stage funding into their companies, help them come up with ideas, you could start world changing companies. So one yeah. of our first companies, Preply, just did a series B round. They're the largest online tutoring marketplace. Um, so that was one of our companies. They just did that deal last week. Um, Promo Republic is another one, but that was kind of the nature of it. It was early stage seed, seed deals. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, again, anyone who knows a little bit about that part of the world, Ukraine and, and these areas are obviously extremely well known for some really smart tech groups. Right. I mean, that, you know, it's, I guess that's why you maybe you realize that as well, right? where you're on the ground. Um, just incredible. Yep. 
um, uh, you know, programmers and others are coming out there. So uh, very interesting. Now, I know you also did some work with uh, Andreessen Horowitz, right? I mean, again, a big name there. Um, you were doing, you know, now was that during the similar time or, or how did that come about? Yeah, so so I did uh, East Labs and then uh, also um, got involved in Tech Minsk. So I met a couple of entrepreneurs in, in Belarus and, and uh, you know, I'm on the board of Tech Minsk, which is a similar kind of uh, entity to East Labs, early mm -hmm. stage capital. Um, it's backed by the U.S. State Department. And then about 2013, I had the vision of wouldn't it be cool to live around the world? Um, it was more of an idea, kind of like, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be globally nomadic? Right. Um, and uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were living in Ukraine. I'd you know, done this VC fund. And so I'd gone on a quick business trip to Asia. And it came back from that trip. I'd traveled to about 15 countries, wow. uh, ended up realizing that Vietnam was the place that I wanted to go next. Right. Um, she's really open. So we ended up moving to Saigon. Mm. Um, and in about a month in, um, I ran into or on the phone, connect, reconnected with uh, an entrepreneur who had started a company called TopTal. Uh, TopTal is an Andreessen Horowitz-backed talent marketplace. Right. Now it's now it's the biggest marketplace in the world. At that time, it was you know just starting. I was uh, one of the first employees there, the first biz dev employee, and uh, helped to uh, grow and scale TopTal. And TopTal is backed again by Andreessen and you know a number of other people, um, pretty well known, and uh, helped grow and scale that. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah. So we're, we're and we're slowly making our way up here um, to get to Super Worlds, obviously, uh, very soon here. But again, you, you, there's several other initiatives still, uh, which I just want to touch on for a little bit. Um, and it, one is called the Roke Initiative Studios. Um, talk a bit about that. What, what was that all about? And, and uh, you know, where were you at that time, actually, when you started that? Were you in, uh, in Vietnam still? Or, or where is that? Yeah, so I ended up traveling all over the world uh, with TopTal because TopTal is totally distributed. So, you know, it was one of the first companies that has been around. You know, now we take for granted work from home, living distributed, remote lifestyle. Yeah. But back then, you know, people had no idea like, wait, how do you work at home? <laughs> you know, how do you work distributed? Yes. Um, and TopTal is one of the kind of the pioneers in that space okay. um, because that's how their workforce is. It's totally distributed. So we started okay. living in Vietnam. We lived in Russia for a while, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, Colombia, wow. Mexico. You're yeah, living I mean, my dream, buddy. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, we still live it that way. And, you know, that's kind of how that started. It's just kind of living everywhere. Mm. But I ended up getting recruited um, by a guy to, to join a company on the, on the YouTube platform. Um, join that company. And at that company is I, I, where I met my co-founders for Rogue Initiative and Superworld. Right. So, um, you know, I was the guy at that company that was kind of helping to bring in capital. Um, you know, having done East Labs and, and uh, you know, been in BC and living all over the world, I'd gotten to know kind of a number of investors globally mm. and, um, you know, pretty well. Um, you know, when you live locally and you're kind of in, native in a place, you really get to know people. And and so uh, long story short, one of the uh, one of the one of my colleagues ended up leaving, starting a, a VR company. Um, we had reconnected, we'd connected after he left and we had an idea, wouldn't it be cool to start a company focused on Hollywood entertainment across film, television, VR, AR, and gaming. Okay. Um, and, and that idea, uh, was born and became the rogue initiative. Um, he had previously produced call of duty, modern warfare series and ghosts and had worked at Amblin and DreamWorks with, uh, Steven Spielberg. And so Michael Bay joined us uh, as a production partner at Rogue Initiative. Uh, and, you know, again, the, the big kind of vision of Rogue Initiative is to create new original content uh, and then take that content across all of those mediums. So create a feature film, a television show, a game, VR, AR, all the way to amusement park rides and toys. Um, and that's that's what we do at Rogue Initiative. So that's that's how that happened and how that started.
That's very cool. Yeah, and then obviously, I think that's that company. Obviously, you're still involved, right? That's still running, and, yes. and you guys are creating new cool things there. I, I love the name, by yes. the way. I think it's cool. Uh, I mean, give me give me one real um, actual project. Maybe you're on uh, working either with with a studios or with a with a with a I guess uh, um, video developers or wh what is it? Sort of you guys are doing there at the moment. Yeah, so we're working on uh, a project uh, with with Michael Bay. So it hasn't um, been uh, you know fully announced yet, but it's parts of it has been announced. Um, and so again, the model is um, a, you know a feature film, television show, game, VR, AR, oh. uh, the whole thing. So yeah. yeah, it'll be a big franchise. Cool. Um, you know, there are there have been. Uh, some some information out there in the press about it, um, so that that again, uh, you know, studios will kind of announce that. Um, we've also done some VR stuff. Uh, you know, we did this thing called uh, uh, Agent Emerson, which is kind of a, a VR short, three hundred and sixty VR. We did Crow: The Drowned Armory, which is a VR experience. Um, so cool. we've done we've done a variety of things on the VR AR side as well that we've released. Mm -hmm. That is very cool, and I guess you know. So again, that's in LA, um, so, it, so it gives you gets you a little bit back to the US here. And obviously, I know you you are a member. When we first caught up, I think you were in Texas, uh, and then you were heading out yep. there, I guess, to San Francisco now, Silicon Valley neighborhood. And, uh, and so we're now nicely, you know. And again, we, we can still talk about several other things. And, and I just want to mention someone because I just again, I think you're an advisor to Singularity Net, which is of course a AI. Uh, decentralized marketplace. Um, I think you're an advisor to Future Fronts, which again does all sort of visionary stuff. I mean, you, you are all over the place, um, or, or at least involved in so many unique things. So that what you then came up with, which is Super Worlds, we're going to talk about in a minute here, uh, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, are, are there, have we missed anything till you, till so far, which you you uh, we should highlight of? You're just showing your incredible background and and, uh, and the amazing things you're involved in, or is it time to talk about Superworld? No, I think, no. Thanks so much for covering that. And you know, no, I think it, you know I, I've always been interested in, in travel and cultures and you know people and um, I'm always I've been, always been a curious person. Um, and so you know, Superworld really kind of brings all of these different areas of of my experience in life and and interests uh, together in a very nice way. So mm. you know, I'm very happy and and excited about sharing the story of Superworld with you guys. Yeah, look, let's let's dive in there. So again, it's it's the it's mm -hmm. a virtual world, right? Augmented mm -hmm. reality mapped into the real world. Yep. Um, that's how I would describe mm -hmm. it. But let's get let's hear it from you directly. You know, really give us a good sense. What is Superworld? Um, how does it function? You know, again, you've been on it obviously for a couple of years, and just recently, um, I think you I meant you shared with me you, you brought in a new big investor, which is exciting. So talk about all this stuff. Yeah, so you know the, the story of Superworld really originated uh, about four years ago. Um, you know, Pokemon Go came out and became this huge, you know, yeah. world sensation. As many people know, a lot of people don't know, but it was the fastest company in history to hit a billion dollars in revenue. Right. And uh, you know, it also you know this year was one of their best years ever. So I think they you know just heard that they had about two billion dollars of revenue this year right. in COVID times, right? And, and that's so amazing. Actually, ago, I, I thought they completely yeah. disappeared. Because I know I remember that when it was so crazy, all my kids were doing it, and then it just sort of disappeared. But I guess it is still around, right? Uh, and then still growing, yeah. which is great. Big time, yeah. I think the revenue is bigger than Fortnite, right? And you hear a lot about Fortnite, yeah, um, well, so it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and 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 you know, we thought to ourselves, you know what? If we can't build the next Pokemon Go, what if we could build a world? What if we could build a place where the next thousand Pokemon Goes gets built onto it, right? And that was the high level vision of Superworld. And I'm using the Pokemon Go as an analogy right. for adding digital information to the real world. And I, you know, I partnered with my co-founder Max Moon. Max has done a few different companies, so he did X Fire and sold it to Viacom. But he's done Fizzle, Sliver, Skit, and Toonstar, all venture back companies. And Sliver and Toonstar are both in the immersive space. And then he previously worked with Stephen Hawking at Cambridge in his department. So super smart guy. And, and <laughs> we got together. Like yeah, yeah, he is. He is. And, and we got together and we were like, you know what? Let's build a world, right? That was right. the big vision. And, and so what is Superworld? You know, we're in Superworld right now, Marcus. You know, it's all around us in right. the real world. Um, so if you know if I come to 
you know, uh, Bangkok or, or New York or London or Paris or anywhere, you could say, hey, Rich, just check out my world. And I could walk around and you've left me things. Mm. You've left a hologram of yourself somewhere fully interactive. I can talk to you. You've left photos and videos in different places. You've left messages at your favorite restaurants about what I should eat and drink. You basically personalize the real world in augmented reality. I have a world. You have a world. You know, Manchester United can have a world. They could have a, you know, a football player somewhere. You could have, you know, balls in one place or, you know, Nike in the same exact place could have a Nike shoe because any spot in space could have an infinite number of items because all of these worlds are just filters on top of the real world, right? It could be an unlimited number of filters. And so Superworld is a combination of Pokemon Go, which is, you know, and again, an analogy for adding digital information to the real world meets Foursquare which is the data analogy. Right. On the data side, I want to make it clear, you know, Superworld's all about enhancing your real life. Right. There was a documentary called Social Dilemma that came out, which mm-hmm. was all about people getting programmed and, you know, getting in these algorithmic bubbles where they get sucked into like looking at their phone all day or, you know, getting away from like real world interactions. Right. And Superworld does not want to do that. Superworld's all about, you know, creating and empowering people to live their real life. Mm. Um, uh, and that's that's what we're doing. So on the data side, it's really important. And then finally, you know, we've divided the surface of the Earth into 64 billion blocks. And this is the right. monopoly aspect of what we're doing. And so you can actually buy Superworld. You're Correct. selling the whole world. And if you buy a block, you get a share of any of the commerce, advertising, transactions, e-commerce, digital commerce, data, analytics, and gaming. And so there's a whole ecosystem on top of this, right, with a mobile app and an NFT salon. We're going to get into the sports stuff, but there's you know a lot of stuff that can happen on top. And part of buying the real estate is you get a share of any of that happens and any of the filters that happen on your property. Right. And, and these, what was it, 60 billion blocks there, they're all on blockchain, right? That's part of the trick yes. here, right? Right. That's right. That's right. So, so it's all in it. So it's blockchain. Now, is each block already, you know, and the, the word probably didn't exist NFT when you started, right? I don't know what it was called at that time. Um, you know, it's just a token, I guess. Um, so that's that was always part of your, you know, your plan anyway, right? Each you can buy these parcels or these these blocks, um, and it's it's just it's on blockchain, right? And and therefore it is a, uh, you know, it's a unique item, correct? Yeah, that's right. We were one of the first NFT companies that launched, right? So we launched, you know, in the summer of 2018. So, you know, pretty early to that game. We've been around for, you know, in NFTs for at least almost three years already. So, um, yeah, 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 it's exactly right. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. Again, I mean, I think the word NFT is just sort of, I would call, I would say in the last three, four months, I sort of popped up on my radar at least. And, and, you know, but it's been around, you know, since 2017, you know, I think, um, what's the company called? Alchemy Technologies, right? They were one of the earlier ones in there, right? When and, and CryptoPunks um, was obviously part of it. So this is all sort of your world, I guess, happening again several years ago already. Which I think for most people <laughs> they had no idea unless you follow this this particular space. Now again, let's bring it a little back to to my world here of you know sports and and entertainment, etc. Um, now you have, of course, these virtual stadiums, right? Um, the, the 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 Yankee Stadium, the Man United Stadium, the whatever you call it, the O2 Arenas are all part of your virtual world. Um, how does it work? You know, I can buy this now. You know, how how does it? You know, you know, are there again? You know, there are issues about IP ownerships and things like that. Just talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. So how it works is, you know, we've geographically mapped Superworld on top of the real world into blocks that are about 100 meters by 100 meters square. And so, yeah, you could buy, you know, overlays of any real world space. So, you know, a lot of people do buy stadiums um, and, you know, they're they're fans of the the sports team that's playing in the stadium or maybe they're fans of the opposing team. (laughs) Um, But they, they they buy the stadium because they understand that there's going to be a lot of fans uh, in that location. And, you know, a stadium just generally has a lot of 
you know, potential user activity, um, you know, from, from anyone um, in that area. And so, you know, ultimately the reason you want to buy places is because not only is it because it's an NFT that you can buy and sell, and there's a lot of different properties of, you know, why someone would value an NFT besides just, Hey, this is the stadium. It could be, it could just be for that reason, right. but also in super world, you get a share of any of the user activity that happens there. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, users understand that, um, a stadium has a, a lot of activity. And so that's the reason to buy those places. Right. Um, and so yeah. again, you know, Talk us through a little bit, just the basics of how do you buy it, right? Do you uh, you buy it with fiat currency? You need crypto already to purchase it. How easy is that process to purchase some of the something? <laughs> you know, it's it's really funny. I uh, I have a, a friend. He's the actually the creator of Ethernet. Uh, his name's Bob Metcalf. Um, very famous guy. He created Metcalf's Law. Right. Um, so he had a he had a call with me today. He was like, Hey, I need to buy some land on, on super world for my properties. Can you, can you walk me through this? Right. So, right. you know, um, the point is, 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 is it, it can be easier than it is now. So hopefully, you know, we're going to make it easier and easier as time goes by. We're kind of in like the dial up stage of the internet, especially on Ethereum. Right. Um, just cause you have to know what a, a MetaMask wallet is. Um, it's a web three wallet, which you can download and install right on your Chrome browser. Right. So, you know, it, it takes a few clicks. You got to download that wallet. You got to put Ether on your wallet. And then once you have Ether and you have your wallet connected, mm -hmm. then you're ready to go. Then you okay. just, you know, look on the map, find places that you like to buy. You click on the map and then you can buy them and you can reprice them to sell them immediately. Right. Okay. And, and if I remember yeah. you know, one of our conversations we had before, um, part of it is, of course, is there is some forms besides, you know, maybe the, the parcel, uh, I guess the, the value goes up being an NFT. Uh, but you also said there will be commercialization opportunities, right? You could, you know, if you own a building, you could, uh, you can put billboards up there or other sort of things. Right? I mean, there, there is a whole bunch of other elements to that, that you know, maybe give us a couple of those examples. Yeah. So, you know, the, the main reason that a lot of people buy properties is they want to, you know, either participate or help create activity on their land. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a number of things that are coming that are going to allow you to, one, you know, uh, create monetization as well as create, you know, content anywhere. And so what's coming uh, is uh, we have an NFT marketplace um, that's launching very soon that will allow anyone, any, you know, any person, any user, any influencer, any sports influencer, any, um, you know, digital artist, you, you name it, um, to take any file that they have and create an NFT in our marketplace. Right. And then, you know, and then market that NFT to their fans or, you know, if, if it's a sports club to, you know, all of their followers and fans, et cetera, and, and, you know, be able to create a digital asset that can be bought and sold. And then, you know, ultimately we have a mobile app, as I mentioned, that that's an open beta right now. I think in a, a couple of months it should be ready to fully launch. But that, that mobile app is going to be this like magic app in your pocket, which allows you to, you know, again, if you're sitting in Bangkok I can, and you're in the park, I can go boop and I can say, hey, turn around. And, you know, now there's a big soccer ball, you know, football behind you, you know, in augmented reality um, and vice versa. You could put something in that park and I could click on it in Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever I am and see it appear in front of me in augmented reality. And so the idea is that, you know, you can not only create, discover, and monetize content anywhere, but a lot of that content could be programmable content like NFTs, and you can put that NFT content in locations. And you can even force people to go to certain locations. Back right. to, you know, the Pokemon Go example, you right. can say, hey, go to the park and go and activate this thing. Um, and, you know, besides that, there's a lot of, you know, and I can talk about our investors, you know, Tim Draper, uh, through Draper going home, just invested in the company. And, um, you know, he he has a, a very strong interest because of his portfolio. And so do we, by the way, in O to O opportunities. So online to offline, right? right? And so, you know, all of those things that you can do in the virtual world, you can that can be, you know, buying a ticket in the real world to the stadium or buying ticket to a certain fan experience or, you know, even esports or whatever it is. 
So uh, a bunch of questions popping in my head here just listening to you. One is, have you already had conversations with the owners of these venues, right? It has, you know, Man United or anyone or the Yankees come to you and say, hey, which, you know, we, we want to make sure that we, we own our piece of the property in the real world uh, on your digital world. And then let's start figuring out how to create events, how to, you know, connect with our fans and, and of course, you know, taking whatever they do in the real world into this into the digital world. Have you had any of that yet or, or that's sort of uh, what hopefully we'll be helping you with to, to get started? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we would love your help in, in doing that. And, you know, uh, we really want to go with, um, you know, someone like yourself who kind of understands that market really well and, you know, um, can can help us kind of a optimize access and opportunities there. Um, you know, I think conventionally, as we look at you know, the real estate market in the physical world, and we look at what we're doing in the virtual world and super world, you know, there are a lot of links to it. I think the virtual world offers um, a, a lot of opportunities uh, for developers even, right? So, you know, like you think of any specific property, maybe that property is being, you know, it's on property that's owned by someone else, right? right. Um, and so it doesn't have to necessarily be that the stadium buys the property in Superworld. There are There is a concept of just, you know, real estate development. Um, so we've had some conversations with some pretty big developers who've come to us, mm. um, who own lots of property, property in general, just all kinds of property in the real world, mm -hmm. um, because they're interested in in buying you know virtual land and that's been happening quite a bit so you know I, as i said i had a call today with bob metcalf who's a pretty well-known guy who wants to buy you know his properties in the physical world in right. super world right um and and so you know again that that's happening all the time and that's happening naturally so they're just going and buying it as they find this out that this exists right interesting yeah i mean again fascinating stuff um, now, I want to get into the uh, the NFT side of it, right? And you mentioned you're on top of or, or connected to Superworld, which I guess it, also for everyone who wants to check it out, right? It's superworldapp.com, right? A A P. That's right. That's the uh, yep. domain name uh, to, to get and check out Superworlds. Now, you know, you, so you're building the NFT marketplace uh, connected to it, and and so let's 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 really dig a bit deeper into N the N NFT world, which you know you've been in there for a couple of years. As I said, for anyone in our industry, if they haven't heard of NBA Hotshots or Sorare, um, which is you know the football world, um, sort of it's a fantasy NFT, um, then you must be asleep basically. But you know, so let's let's uh, let's be nice here and, and explain really a bit. First of all, what it, on earth is NFT, right? Um, you know, let's start with the basics and then we'll get more technical yeah yeah so you know most people when they think of crypto they think of you know bitcoin and some people might even know ethereum or they they know about a lot of altcoins out right. there right like doge dogecoin yeah. or other coins or they and these coins, coins are <laughs> <laughs> shit coins yeah um and you know a lot of these coins are are fungible tokens right? right and basically what that means is is that if you have one of them and i have one of them and you sell yours and i sell yours we're probably going to get the same amount of money because the, the the value of those coins is floating on a market price right. right we can we can both see what the price of bitcoin is and if you have one bitcoin and i have one i'm going to get the same amount of money that you are if we sell at the same time yeah. now the difference between a fund token which is what is bitcoin um and a non-fungible token is a non-fungible token is if you have one and i have one they're different they're, you know what you have is very unique and what i have is very unique so if we think of the super world example you know if you own you know manchester united stadium right um and and i own you know some field in the countryside somewhere or some part of the desert you know that maybe like you know, the stadium is worth more to someone, especially a fan of Manchester United, than the, you know, the piece of desert that I own. Right. But the piece of desert I might own is the place where Burning Man happens. <laughs> Do you get right. what I mean? And yeah. there might be someone who would want to pay much, much more for that piece of desert where Burning Man is. is. So what's interesting about a non-fungible token is the value of the non-fungible token is really predicated on a million different factors, especially who the buyer and seller are. 
And so if you think of like a baseball card or some kind of sports card as an example or a piece of art in the physical world, yes. you know, those those are examples of, of non fungibility because each each actual item, you know, is unique. In, in many ways, even a baseball card is like numbered or, you know, has a year and a team and a player and, you know, a certain quality to it or a certain condition it's in. And all those factors contribute to the price. And that that's what the essence of a non-fungible token is. Besides, this is an, a digital way of doing that where right. it's, it's transferable and it's programmable and more importantly, yeah. which means that if you sell it, you can program it to pay off you know, in certain ways and have some revenue streams and to keep paying you every time it gets resold. So there's a lot of different, you know, uh, you know, features that a non-fungible token has. You can get one, you can get one that allows you to have features in the offline world too. If you buy, if you buy this NFT, it allows you to do something at the stadium, you know, with your regular ticket, you know, yeah. but lots of things like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my head is already spinning, uh, just thinking of a million ideas of how you bring these pieces together. And, and, and that's obviously where we're going with our discussion here. But, but I also just wanted to throw a couple of numbers out, again, for anyone who isn't as deep into the space, to get a sense how big this already is. So the NBA Hot Shots, um, it's only been around, I would say, uh, whatever it is now, several months or so, um, already generated over 200 million US dollars um, of new of basically new revenue. Uh, I think CryptoPunks, which was one of the earlier ones uh, out there, did has done about $130 million worth with, I think, the, the most expensive one selling for $7.5 million, which is, basic, again, is a small digital artwork, right? And then, you know, again, this was sort of CNN news, so more people might have read about it, is uh, the, the digital artist, I don't know if you pronounce him, is it Pebbles or Peebles or whatever, who uh, sold his artwork for $69 million fairly recently, right? Uh, so again, th these are big numbers, right? This isn't just, you know, a $10 little uh, um, baseball cart here anymore. Um, you know, even though what uh, the NBA Hotshot does exactly, it is very much following that, uh, you know, I guess the baseball card model, right? You buy little packs of cards, you know, you have to get in line. <laughs> you know, I've, I've tried to buy one, it is impossible. You have 300,000 other people in front of you waiting to buy one of these packs and then you open them up like you would open up a traditional pack um, and then you see what's in it. The difference is these are uh, video images, right? It's not a just a still image or a digital still image. It's an actual video clip, you know, whatever it is, 10 seconds of uh, a, a player doing something amazing, right? A, a slam dunk or an amazing pass or something like this. So now here's where it gets really interesting where, you know, I just I'm fascinated by because the content two things one is the content is out there already right <laughs> it's now just on blockchain which means you you can track it and and therefore you can itemize it uh, that's one on the other hand it is archive material basically the stuff which normally in the world of sports marketing or sports means very little right the value of live content to archive you know i would argue is about 99 percent drop very shortly after the the live event is over right and so now someone is coming up with these ways where you creating monetization of of content which was never there before um, and that's really i think where where your nft marketplace is heading right where you guys are now creating an opportunity for someone to bring content or to create any form of ip um and turn it into nfts and of on, on the back of it creating new value right this is is that the big picture or or how would you frame this yeah, you know, I think that the opportunity is is just that is the ability to, um, you know, to create uh, monetization opportunities um, from the ability to create assets out of uh, content, out of experiences, out of. Um, you know, in our case, virtual land, right? I mean, literally almost anything can be digitized and created into an asset. Um, and in the sports world, I think that, you know, what's very interesting 
is you have uh, a lot of these, you know, quote unquote moments or experiences that people really, you know, relish, yep. whether it's, yep. you know, uh, something that they've seen um, in a live game that they remember as some memorable, you know, uh, ex- you know, situation or experience or shot or, you know, uh, inning in a game or whatever, whatever sport you're talking about. Um, and, or a player doing something and, you know, there's so many different interactions and the beauty of an NFT is you can, you can monetize and memorialize all of them and make them tradable. But yeah. And, and again, you know, I, I, since I've gotten into this space here and learning and studying, I mean, it's sort of, it is happening, right? So, uh, I, I read about Ubisoft, which is, is obviously a game developer, uh, partnering with the Belgium Football League to create a, um, you know, a, a, I guess it's, again, it's an NFT blockchain, uh, um, fantasy program so there are different forms of it right we got our buddy uh, from socios here who has team tokens where you know you could acquire something so i mean they not any nft is is the same as well right there's a lot of differences so i think we we, we want to capture that a bit as well um, now again what you're looking to do at the moment is i think you're also working with artists right um who create digital art and, and you're looking at music um, you know, give us maybe one specific example of really what you're already working on there um, and, and how your NFT marketplace will look like and how easy it will be to, I guess let's call it, onboard the content. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, you know, our broader vision is we're a world at Superworld right. and, you know, it, it's, it, it can really be anything um, under the sun. Um, you know, a, a lot of what's happening in the NFT world right now, outside of, you know, NBA top shots is, you know, a, a digital arts, a big component of that, as well as, um, you know, uh, music and, you know, other, other types of entertainment content. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at super world, because we're a world, because there's a, a lot of different angles to this, um, you know, we're, we're creating an NFT salon, which is vertically integrated with our world. And right. so again, all of those users, whether they're, you know, again, back to the buying a stadium, you know, that I would characterize that, you know, super citizen as someone who's a sports fan, right? If they're buying stadiums. And so they would want to do, you know, sports content as an NFT, or they would be interested in that. And then there's other, you know, uh, super citizens of super world that are into the music scene or the digital art scene. And, you know, one of our most famous artists in residence is uh, Krista Kim, who sold her Mars house and, you know, was on CN- CNBC and literally all over the world news. Uh, in the last couple of weeks is the most expensive digital house. So she comes from the architecture world, right? Okay. And so, you know, we're connected with lots of, you know, millions of architects now right. uh, who have, you know, digital items that they want to put in Superworld, like the Mars house. Got and it. so, you know, it could be cars, it could be F1, you know, it could be, um, we've, we're having lots of conversations across all of those segments. And I think ultimately the product that we're launching in the NFT salon, um, is going to be catered to each of those markets. And so the sports, you know, side of it will be more for sports fans. The, you know, the art side of it will be more for art and, you know, and, and, and all of these things. So it'll be the long tail of, of NFT content, but most importantly, you know, you'll be able to put those NFTs in the real world. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that is where your your that I think that's the differentiation which we talked about before, right? To others, you know, there are other platforms who you will be able to trade and buy and sell and and maybe upload those things. Uh, but you are that the trick here is you are be able to drop it into Super World with as a there be a VR element to it, right? That, that's sort of a part of the differentiator, correct? That's right. That's right. And we're very open to working with all those other marketplaces and anything you buy or sell or create in our marketplace, you can sell anywhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But the benefit of of utilizing our marketplace is that you can, you know, again, very easily kind of, 
you know, place that content in Superworld. Now you can do that with other NFTs, regardless of where you create them or buy them from. Um, so we are, you know, we are creating a very open world, um, to be clear, that works, you know, across all of those marketplaces. Um, but you know, again, there are advantages to, to to build on our vertically integrated NFT salon when you're creating new assets. Because right. there's you know, other places like OpenSea and 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 you know several others I've read about. Uh, you know, yep. again, you know, how does that all work? How easy is it um, to really connect this? Uh, how freely can you move your NFT from one place to the other? Is that already possible, or that you know, crypto isn't quite there yet? Yeah, I mean, it is possible. And if you, you know, create anything in Superworld, for example, you can, you know, buy it on on OpenSea. So OpenSea has a pretty great, you know, platform in terms of um, allowing anyone to you know, uh, sell their NFTs on OpenSea, um, and vice versa. We'll do the same at Superworld. Um, so we're very open. There's other platforms that are a little bit more closed. So you know, uh, Super Rare is one of them. Nifty Gateway is another one where, which you you know you, you couldn't you can't just like sign up. There's a there's a process and things to sell NFTs. And so they have you know there some of them are geared for artists. There's one called Foundation. You know, they all have like kind of different niches. But I would say the 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 vision and kind of our 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 platform at superworld is a very open one so we want to make sure that anyone who wants to create digital assets and we have an onboarding process so we have, you know, inner inner circle at superworldapp.com where anyone who wants to create an NFT, I urge you to email us there, inner circle at superworldapp.com, and we'll we'll walk you through the whole process of creating a digital asset. How do you market yourself properly? You know, how how does that the whole thing work? How do you program it? All of that stuff. So you can get into that world. Whether you're an artist, you're a sports fan, whether you're a music lover, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, I love this. And, and again, this is sort of why we're on this call to I, I really want to expose what, what you're doing there to the world uh, and get people to start thinking about it because – uh, I've, I have getting I'm getting calls from you know sports IP owners uh, we shall nameless uh, remain nameless here um, but they're asking about it you know saying Marcus you know what do you think you know how do we get into an NFT how can we create it I, I'm aware of conversation of uh, you know again the larger crypto exchanges and others are having with big IP owners whether it's the Premier League or others around the world to say look let us create NFTs for you let's do what what the NBA did obviously right which is it's you know maybe the one of the more high profile examples already out there um, so that every uh, IP owner in the world of sports or music etc is looking at it there's no doubt um, and therefore is you know a lot of it you know and then some people are already talking about a bubble which is that maybe is a bit early because I, I think half the world hasn't even figured out yet what it means uh, <laughs> <laughs> or never mind trying to even have to ever be able to buy one of these things so it's, it can yeah. be quite a bubble if you know as I say probably 90% of the world doesn't even know what it, how it works but uh, um, yeah. Now, again, and this is sort of a, a question, you know, when you look at this right now, it's as exciting and as, as you know, crazy tech it sounds like here. Is it really still very much the call it the in the crypto community who is currently playing in this and, and making lots of money uh, with it or has the. You know, I don't know. Real world is the wrong word, but, uh, you know, has the average user already, the average fan already figured this out? You know, it, it is um, something that I, I think at this stage still has a tremendous room for growth um, mm -hmm. in general. Um, you know, I think NBA Top Shot uh, and, you know, the, the company behind that has really helped to make this more ma mainstream. They're right. using a technology uh, called Flow, um, which is, you know, slightly a proprietary technology that they've created. I mean, they've opened it up to other developers and you can, you can get on it and develop on it. Mm -hmm. Um, Ethereum is the biggest, uh, blockchain ecosystem, right. uh, for decentralized applications. Um, and you know, the ERC 721 standard, which is again, a very technical sounding name, but that's, that's kind of what an NFT is on Ethereum. Right. And so, you know, again, it, it depends on on kind of you know how you want to define what you're buying how decentralized you know ultimately the reason these things are important is because you own them they're decentralized right. they're not owned by a centralized party you own them forever and and so you know because of the technical aspect of this because of 
you know, there is a issue with getting a wallet and, you know, MetaMask, and there's a lot of different kind of things you have to learn. Mm. Um, you know, I think that there is still a lot of room to go before this goes super mainstream. Right. You know, there is a lot of first mover action into this. They, you know, and there is a an excitement about it because the technology is, is, is pretty robust and people are now realizing the potential of that technology to be used not only online, but offline. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And that's why are we in it here? Uh, and one other yeah. part, which I think is really uh, important to, uh, to bring up to, for the understanding is that um, different than when you sell an art piece or, or even your Michael Jordan trading card or an autographed T-shirt of or, uh, you know, or jersey of whoever, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, once you sell that, that's it, right? Uh, whether you were the artist who created it or, of course, you were the owner of that piece. Now, um, in again, in, NFT, in the NFT world is that as the artist, the person who's, you know, whatever created the artwork or created that piece, you have... Um, opportunities to earn some of that money in perpetuity as that product trades, correct? That's a that's a big yes. piece of the puzzle, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. The the asset can be programmed um, in whatever way you want it to be programmed. And one of the ways that, you know, most people kind of use these assets is they program to pay yourself every time it resells. And so right. you always you know, get a share of any of that future revenue. And so an artist, when they create something new, you know, has an incentive for that, that thing to keep trading, whatever it is, and, or, you know, a creator in general. And, and so there's a lot of, you know, different aspects of, of kind of how that happens and, you know, how you, you know, you're, you're more, because you're interested in that, that item holding value, um, there's also other considerations that you might make when you create it, right? And, and the buzz around it and the, and, you know, the interest in the artist or the creator or the sports, you know, hero or whatever, sports player, you know, um, in, in what they're doing in their life, right? And so certain items, you know, you see this in jerseys, right? When someone gets in the news, the jersey gets to be really popular and, you know, this is all digital. So a lot of the similar dynamics happening there. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, look, I mean, we, we could keep going here, and I, and I want to maybe you know go a little little one more uh, step in here um, before we wrap it up. Um, now, you know, you mentioned your um, what you call your NFT salon is 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 not far off. Well, what are we talking about here? You you are ready to onboard um, IP in the next couple of weeks, or uh, you know, when when you guys are ready to to jump on this here? We'll get involved in it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So it's coming very soon. You know, um, uh, you know, without naming a date, um, early in April. You know, All something right. like that. Early April, and uh, so you know, the, the idea right now is what we're doing is, you know, onboarding NFT creators. So anyone who wants to create, you know, if you're new to this, if you don't know what what we're talking about, and you want to get in on this, just email us inner circle at superworldapp.com and we'll get you in the inner circle and the inner circle is all about you know teaching you how well, how this works what is an nft you know how do you create an nft how do you market yourself properly and we'll help market you as well right. um, to our community so you know we really want to be supportive of nft creators across the sports world that art world you name it so uh, inner circle at superworldapp.com. And if you want to be a collector and you're like, you know what, I might not want to make one of these, but I'd love to start collecting NFTs. Mm. We have something called Collector's Corner. So Collector's Corner at superworldapp.com. Just email again. Just say, hey, I want to be a collector. And again, we'll we'll train you about, you know, what what are NFTs? You know, how do you you know, how do you think about this? What are some, you know, interesting NFTs that are being made? We'll introduce you to, you know, NFT creators. And, you know, so we're, we're kind of looking at both sides of that market and, and trying to educate uh, the, the users there because there's a lot of people that are very interested in this space but don't know where to start. Yep, uh, definitely. And then hopefully if they learned a little bit, you know, in our conversation here over the last hour, not just what an amazing career you have, but, what is the what amazing stuff you're doing here right now? Um, so uh, you know, fantastic. We will make sure all those website the, these email addresses and websites are we're putting out there on the podcast. And by the time the podcast will probably be live, you you'll be very close to uh, either having launched or, or being fully live.
lively. So I'm looking forward to bringing my world of sports and gaming and, and some of the other parts to you guys here and, and keep working there. I, I think it's a fascinating space. Um, you know, as we discussed before, having that experience when you are a sports fan, that you're walking into a sports environment, similar with you and if you are uh, you like you like arts? You want to walk into something which feels like a museum or or a digital museum, right? So I think that's hopefully is what we're going to be seeing here. That it, it, you know it really creates elements where people are in there in these worlds which they're uh, which they love and um, and then experience that digital part of it, um, creating NFTs or of course buying and selling and trading NFTs, which uh, it's just an amazing world, and, and I'm sure we're going to be learning lots more about it and hopefully have some more conversations uh, once once you're live and once we onboard yeah. the first big IP here. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm so excited um, to, to work with you and, and to, uh, you know, really um, – you know, create these amazing experiences for sports fans around the world. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think sports is a, is, is such an amazing category and there's so many different aspects of it. And it's so evolving and, you know, with technology and NFTs, I think there's, you know, it's only the beginning. So I'm yeah. super excited about all that's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyone who knows me and knows my contacts, you can get in touch with me as well. Um, I will connect you with Rich here um, and we'll crack it together. Uh, bring the world of sports to super world and beyond. <laughs> that sounds uh, that sounds pretty cool. I have the sign off here, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. Rich, thank you for your time here. Uh, have a great time in San Francisco. Good evening there. Um, and, uh, you know, look forward to chatting some more very soon here, buddy. Thank you so much, Marcus. A pleasure. And, you know, again, to all your fans, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell our story. Thank you again. I uh, love the amazing stuff. There. Talk to you soon. Bye -bye. See ya. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Luer. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.